Gotta save me from a villain Gotta settle what about him And however could I doubt him this one The end of April 2015 Six or so of us met in our house and in our living room and we began worshiping the Lord and, and looking at scripture and starting to function as a church and praying that God might do something with it. And then little by little, things grew. January 2017, we finally had to move out of our house. We had a time 60, 70, 80 people packed in our living room. So we found a location right on the beach, right in front of the surf really just a dream location to be. One of the core values of us is enjoying God and, and what He's created, experiencing Him, not just learning about Him. That's needed worldwide, but especially here in the North, and that's what we're growing to offer as we ourselves learn to enjoy and experience God. One of my students brought one of her friends, and this friend just loved dance, and she came here just for that purpose. She didn't know this was a church or anything to do with a church, and when she found out, she was amazed that a church includes dance or surf or other activities like skate. Moving into our new church building opened such a huge opportunity for the children's ministry. I think our church really found a heartbeat for kids and um, creating a, a safe place where kids can come from anywhere, any, any season of life and um, feel loved and learn about the love of God. We came here to Portugal to bless uh, the Portuguese people, to share the good news to the Portuguese. But speaking of the translation, we are also open to everyone who join us and we also receive people from other countries. As we've found new life in the Lord Jesus, we want that to spill over and cause other people to find new life. In the same way, we want this church community to spill over into new communities, in new geographical locations, uh, so that more and more of these communities of people finding life in Jesus exist, thrive, and then reproduce themselves. dive in. John 17, verse 20. Jesus is praying. He says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who will believe in me through their word, that they may be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have has uh, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them and you and me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them, even as you have loved me. We get to see a triune interaction. Just before Jesus is betrayed and beaten and cursed and crucified, he is praying to his Father with his disciples present. And fortunately, John pulled his iPhone out and started recording the audio just in time. And we have become privy now to an interaction between Jesus, the Son of God, and the Father God. It's amazing. I don't know if you realize that that is the true Lord's prayer. What are they talking about? Jesus is talking about us. It's unbelievable. Did you catch verse 20? I'm not only asking for these disciples with me, but anyone that would believe in me through their word or through their message. If you're a believer in Jesus, you heard it through the disciples' word, and Jesus, therefore, is talking about you. That's pretty intimate. You know, all these years later, you were thought of. And what's he saying? Alan, hi, man. What's he saying? That they would be one, you guys, us, the church, that we would be one as the Father, Son, and Spirit are one. 
Jesus says, them and me, and I and you, Father, that the world may know. What? Jesus is comparing our unity to the triune unity, the trinity, and not just comparing, but then saying, and they're in us. That's unbelievably good news. Amen. Unbelievably good news. Now, what is the Trinity? We often talk about this, and I've found that in American church culture, which I'm the best at understanding, we're very comfortable with being uncomfortable with the Trinity. It's kind of like this big thing, and I've talked to so many people that are excited to say, yeah, we, I get the Father, Son, Spirit thing, but I don't really understand it. That's okay. We'll never understand it. You know, it's, maybe it's like an egg yolk and an eggshell and the whites and the yellows, or maybe it's like water. Blah, blah. Let me tell you, there's some simple elements to the Trinity that we have to grasp that change everything. Father, Son, and Spirit, the Father has always been the Father, being a Father. Loving, appreciating, enjoying, leading, being with his son, delighting in his son. To be a father, you have to have a son. The son has always been the son. Being a son. Reciprocating, responding to the father's love, enjoying it, appreciating it, respecting him, esteeming him, getting life from him, being with him, delighting in him. That's always been going on. The Holy Spirit quickening, expressing, communicating, accentuating substantially being their love relationship. The Father, Son, and Spirit have always been like that. And what's really cool is that that is our home context. That's where we came from. That's where we, we were created from. We were made uh, by and for the Trinity, the triune God, to know him, to know them, to be known by them, to love them, and to be loved by them. Doesn't that change everything? To know where you're from? As a missionary, that's an important thing, to know where you're from. We forget who we are sometimes. Jesus is so serious about this idea of our unity together in the Trinity that he emphasizes it again. It's a Jewish teaching tactic. When it's repeated, it's emphasized. Guess how many times Jesus talks about it in John 17? Four times in one prayer, this is what the Trinity is talking about, us united in him. That's exciting to know. That really does change everything. How do we practice this? It's a cool concept. It's a cool theology. You may be inspired by it, but what does this mean for you? How do we practice this? How does this practically play out in our lives? Well, all through scripture, there is this theme and Jesus keeps it going. In fact, at a, a moment when people are trying to trick him and trap him in some theological spot where they can then twist his words and, and get him, they say, okay, Jesus, what's the greatest thing? What's the greatest command? What's the chief end of, of what we can do on this earth, you know? And Jesus, without even thinking about it, says what you guys know. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. That's it. Even that, though, we are unable to do on our own. We can't conjure up emotion or conjure up this or that to, to bring our whole heart, soul, and mind to love the Lord. It has to be a reciprocation. It has to be a response to it. And I love that John, I love the apostle John, he unpackages this even more in his first epistle saying, now this is love. It's not that we love God. We didn't conjure up this great thing. It's that he loved us and he sent his, he demonstrated his love by sending his son to die in our place, to bring us back to this triune, wonderful family that we were made for and by. Then he goes on to say, we only love because he first loved us. Our job, our greatest command to fulfill, to love him with all that we are, is a reciprocation and a response to his great love for us. All right, Troy, I appreciate that. Uh, but we talk so much about God's love and Jesus loves you. We become desensitized to actually the intense power that's wrapped up in 
these words, God loves you, Jesus loves you. So I want to tell you a little story about where this kind of became real to me, where one more layer of humanity was broken and I could experience a deeper, at a deeper level, God's love for us. This happened December 19th, 2008. I was on a job in Hillsboro and I got a call from my very pregnant wife saying, Troy, something is not right with the baby. Uh, doesn't feel good. There's no movement, and it was a very active baby. Um, so she says, I'm going to go into the hospital. I said, great plan. Call me when you know what's going on. She called me back about an hour and a half later saying, they're not going to let me leave until we have this baby. I was like, oh, but we have three weeks. <laughs> you know, it's, the transition into fatherhood uh, for a young man, I think, is, is a difficult or challenging one. And I mean, I was counting the days and minutes like, I need more time. We have three weeks and uh, we don't have the nursery ready. We had, I thought we had three weeks. But um, anyway, she goes into the hospital. I leave my job and come in and meet her there. And I find her in a closet at Emmanuel. All of the birthing rooms were full at that point. And so they kind of put us into a little storage area and hooked up all the vital machines and everything to, to track what's going on. Eventually, they moved us into a birthing room, and uh, we, you know, watched a movie. We didn't have a TV at the time. Those, those uh, TVs at the hospital were awesome. We were always trying to go to the hospital. <laughs> but we fell asleep from the, the stress and intensity of the reality of what was about to happen. And just before midnight, you know, beep, 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 all the alarms start going off, and the operating crew comes rushing in. They take the brakes off of her bed. They're saying, come on, Dad, you gotta be, you gotta, if you're coming, you gotta come now. We, the baby hadn't had a good heartbeat in eight minutes. Everything was, was indicating that if we don't get this baby out now, we're gonna lose this baby. And so we, you know, we rush in and they put Michelle on the table and they give her the spinal tap and immediately she has a reaction to it and starts suffocating. She can't breathe. She's grabbing my finger. I'm like, can someone help her? You know, and they come over and they start resuscitating her, getting the oxygen on her, making sure she's stable. Meanwhile, they put the curtain so she can't see what's going on. They cut her open and the, the head surgeon starts cursing. Which, try to imagine a scenario where that's comforting. <laughs> In the operating room, the surgeon is using the big boy words. That, <laughs> that's awesome. Nice hair. It looks really good. The, the stress of this moment, it was just absolutely crazy. And finally, they pull Cohen, my firstborn, out. I'll do my best to get through this without too much emotion. The, the uh, umbilical cord was wrapped around his head. Um, four times, his neck four times with a true knot, and he was just getting absolutely strangled, squashed every time there was a little Braxton Hicks uh, contraction. And they hand him to me. I think we have a photo of it. This first moment where I'm holding my little baby boy. And this is the biggest moment of my life. And as I'm there shaking at the reality of all of this, and what just happened, the father begins to speak to me. And he says, congratulations, my boy. I love you. I'm proud of you. Welcome to fatherhood. I'm sitting there just shaking. How much do you love your son? And I said, I love him with my whole heart. You got to picture this. I'm over in the corner just having this inaudible conversation. My mouth is moving and the operating crew, like the stress, they must have just thought the stress of this is, is killing them. I'm sitting there talking to, to the father with my boy. I love him with my whole heart. I was worried about this because I love, I love my wife. I love my family. I love my church. I love the Lord. I love, I love, I love. I was at capacity. How am I going to love a child like a child deserves to be loved? you know, by a father, but man, the resource came from on high and I was just, man, I love him with all that I am, all that I am. And the father said, yeah, yeah. And by the way, you may be thinking, how does the father talk? He does talk to us. If you open your, your, the ears and the eyes of your heart, if you have an appetite for it, we just read in John 20, Jesus saying, father, you love them, you guys, as you love me. That's how loved you are. It's better than you know. The father does talk. And he was speaking to my heart. And then he asked me a really provocative, deep question. Why do you love your son? What do you mean, why do I love my son? Well, 
You lost money on the job that you had to leave. As soon as you stepped foot in that hospital, those bills, they didn't get smaller. They got bigger. The apple of your eye, your bride, who you love with your whole heart, literally is broken before you almost died. Because of that, she broke three of your fingers. You know, you didn't cause the operating crew a whole lot of lighthearted fun. There was stress. There was pain. There was traumatic excitement. It was absolutely crazy. And worse things, I wore a nice shirt that I liked and Cohen's goo got onto it and it ruined my shirt. Like this little baby has done absolutely nothing for us at this point. In fact, if a grown man would have caused the stress to me and my wife that Cohen did in that moment, I mean, that's like, let's get ready to fight. I want to protect my family. Nonetheless... In comparison to the rich, deep, unconditional love I was feeling for this little boy in this moment, I was like, I don't, I don't even care about that stuff. It doesn't even register to me. I love him with all that I am. I would do anything for this little boy. And the father says, yeah, that's how I love you. In fact, way more. Troy, where do you think that comes from? Where do you think that, that feeling, that intense pursuing love comes from that you're feeling right now? Trace it back. That's flowing out of my heart, and it's for you. I love you despite the things that you do. You don't need to try so hard to catch my attention and my affection and my love. You have it. And if the Bible's true, if Jesus is right, then that's how the Father feels for you as well. I hope you remember that story. Probably it'll stir up a story or uh, something you can relate with. These moments, they open our hearts, help us to comprehend a little bit more how great the Father's love is for us. Let me just pray a quick prayer, a rendition of Paul's prayer for the Ephesians, for you, Good Shepherd, that we would know and comprehend the four-dimensional love, the, the breadth, the height, the width, the length of God's love for us demonstrated in Jesus' life on this earth for us. You know what I said to the Father as he told me he loved me? It wasn't super eloquent. I said, well, I love you too. That's the great command being fulfilled. That's God resourcing me, opening my eyes, causing me to respond to his great love. I love you too. That is the fulfillment of the great command. Think about the ways God has loved you. He's shown you in so many ways. And tell him, I love you too. I love you too. Welcome to the Global Outreach Weekend. Um, Our hope, of course, is to stir your hearts and recruit you to the mission field to be involved in what's going on. So ushers, if you guys could lock the doors and we'll get the, the spotlights out and see if we can sweat some action out of you. I'm... Joking, absolutely joking. Um, but but my name is Troy. This is Global Outreach Weekend. Our theme is into the whole world. Uh, my wife and I, Michelle, uh, we've been church planting in Portugal for the last five years. We've been in Europe in Europe for eight years. From our unity and love, four lives have come forth that bear our image: Cohen Fletcher, Kalia, and Sora. And over there, we're we're making and creating and and enjoying a new family as well. I actually want to invite invite them up on stage and and, uh, actually show off. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just (laughs) going up, guys. You know, you clap, and you should, and you should be proud. This church has sent us. Many of you guys have walked personally with uh, praying through supporting our ministry. This is your fruit. You guys got to know, these guys came around the world to come here and and love on you guys and serve you guys. This is the return on your investment, and they're doing incredible things. The the real deal, if you want to be successful in life, surround yourself with people better than you. These guys are better better than me. Really, yeah. You keep... We'll hold the comments to the end if you don't mind, Tony. But it's true. I'm going to let them introduce themselves and and quickly say where you're from, uh, what you're involved with. 
Good morning, church. I'm Samuel. I'm married with Claudia um, and father of Levi and Lila. Um, I was raised and born in Brazil, but I'm half Portuguese. And five years ago, when Troy moved to Portugal, I moved to Portugal with him. And since then, we are planting churches. Now I'm uh, leading this church we plant in Porto, one of the main cities in the north of Portugal. Hey, good morning. My name is Nuno. Um, my wife is Gila. We have two children, uh, Leonor and Diogo. And uh, we were living in the Middle East. We are from, I'm Portuguese, we are from Portugal. But we were living in the Middle East and about two years ago, God called us back to Portugal and in faith we left everything and we moved back. And soon after, um, yeah, God crossed my life with <coughs> Troy. And 11 months ago, a new church was planted in Vienna, it's, which I'm leading now. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Angelica. Uh, is my um, beautiful man, Vladimir. <laughs> <laughs> I don't speak English. <laughs> uh, we are from Ukraine, but live in Sedwin in Portugal. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, my wife really don't speak English, so it's a big deal to uh, to speak up front here. We are uh, originally from Ukraine, and we work in Portugal with the high school uh, ministry. So we spread the good news about Jesus in the high school when less than half percent of the kids have have heard about that it's possible to have a relationship with the Christ. And we do it, uh, I, I was um, reached out when I was 18 in the high school and my love and passion through these kids make me to do this in the partnership with our friends, Surf Church. Yeah. I love you guys. I love you guys. These are incredible people. Really, last night was the first time I've ever heard Angelica speak English. <laughs> Imagine the courage. In fact, why don't, why don't you guys come over to Portugal and stand up and speak Portuguese? <laughs> well done, guys. Now, we're going to do a, do a little teachable demonstration here for you. Just like we learned and f we follow the Lord Jesus, we learn from him to repeat what deserves emphasis. And so I'm going to repeat... Uh, the teaching of what Jesus is praying in the passage that we have by showing a little demonstration. So why don't you guys come over here together and form the Trinity. So this is the Father, Son, and Spirit. As you can see, they are enjoying each other. They are united. They're laughing. They're appreciating. There's respect, esteem. This is just a life-giving family, united God from which we come from. And at some point... Man and woman in their image was created, and it was wonderful. We see in Scripture that, that God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. There was innocence and unity and wonder, wonderment at one point, exercising our freedom of choice. Humanity walked away, and they found satisfaction in something that God did not offer, and it caused separation. And you guys have lived long enough to know the symptoms of separation, the loneliness, the despair, the desperation, the discouragement, the depression, the pain. What, like, what is this all about? It's hard. Now, don't worry. The triune God loves us enough that they sent someone to become like us, enacted the costly plan of salvation coming like us, becoming in our image, the creator becoming the creator to grab us and bring us back. And this now, according to the passage that we read, according to the narrative of scripture, is our reality. This is good news for you and I. We are back and in if you are choosing to follow and believe and give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is your journey. When the author of Hebrews says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. This was the joy 
that Jesus saw, the family back together, their beloved rescued. When Paul says, I'm convinced of this, that he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it, this is the good work that he's doing in you. The problem with us, the problem with me, is that I came to Christ, and instead of living there, I just kind of turned and now I'm kind of like this, you know, I, I'm excited by them. I'm, it's like, you know, you listen to a great sermon or you go to a retreat and it's like kind of, kind of close to it. But that's not consistent with the biblical narrative. That is not consistent with theology or God's heart for us. This is, this is where you are. This is home. Welcome home. Now, I'm going to send these guys out. Of course, there's the International Missions Fair out there. Go ahead, guys. Thank you for your work. We have the incredible opportunity to exercise that unity that Jesus paid so much for. Go into the foyer after this. Do not go home and watch sports or whatever. Go into the foyer and love on these guys. Let them love on you. Share stories. Get inspired. Encourage and inspire. Don't miss this incredible opportunity. They are your family through, through me. And it's a wonderful thing that God is doing. So this is the global outreach weekend. This is with the theme into all the world, into every nation. Why is it that we're starting with the great command rather than the great commission? Like this is the traditional weekend where we really hit the great commission, which you guys know is Jesus to his disciples, go into all the nations and make disciples of all men, teaching them everything I taught you, baptizing them in the name of the Trinity. And don't worry, I'm with you. Why didn't we lead with that? The need is great, guys. You don't understand how saturated our communities are here locally with gospel witness. I know it's hard, but the rest of the ends of the earth are full of dark, dark corners where there is no witness or very, very little witness. The country we're serving in, 10 million people, less than 1% of them have any clue about an authentic relationship with God. There is incredible need to take the Great Commission seriously. Why aren't we leading with that? Well, very simply, this is the big idea, because following the Great Commission can only happen once you follow the Great Command. Following the Great Commission can only happen once you've followed the Great Command. In our passage, Jesus says that they would be one together and in me, us together, perfected in unity, that the world may know. The Great Command is love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind. Then love your neighbor as yourself. The Great Commission must be a symptomatic Response or a response to the, the life giving reality of the great command. Essentially, the love family environment of the Trinity must compel us to go out and grab more people to bring us, to bring them into that. If we don't do that, if the great command means nothing in our lives, we will not get the great commission. In fact, obeying the great commission becomes dangerous to ourselves to the people that we're, we're going to. If we go into all the world to tell the world what they need to know and we ourselves don't know it, it's a problem. And let me tell you, the mission field is difficult. It's not an easy thing. There's a reason Jesus left that with the disciples after three years of pouring into them, making sure they knew their identity in him, who they are and whose they are. It's a difficult place. To put it in perspective, the adaptation process, the difficulty, I am actually full-blood Nicaraguan. I used to have rich, flowing black hair with, with beautiful dark skin. The wear and tear and stressful day-to-day -day of the mission field has ripped, it sucked the pigment right out of my body. And I, now I'm like an albino, and I want to thank Jim Gaffigan for that joke. Actually, I want to thank Brian Obrist, where are you, for introducing me to that. And it's not true. I'm not Nicaraguan. But the reality is the Great, Com the Great Commission is not just, oh, let's do it. It requires a firm foundation in knowing who you are, who's you are, experiencing the love, unconditional love of the triune family for you and responding with, I love you too. Then 
The Great Commission is on. I want to define Great Commission of Living because it's, it's fair to say you don't have to go into all the world. You don't have to go overseas to live missionally or Great Commissionally, being liberal with the English language here. As a study group, many of you guys are here. We've worked through this together. We never bring my opinion only, which would be scary for you guys. It's a group of us studying through this. Great Commission of Living is the manifestation of our relationship with God where we naturally, intentionally pour out his love to anyone, anywhere, and at any time. It doesn't matter where you are. Great Commission living is the manifestation of our relationship with God where we naturally, intentionally pour out his love to anyone, anywhere, at any time. That's beautiful and that's sweet. If you're sitting in your chair saying, yeah, that's right, so I don't have to go overseas. I can do that right here. You're not wrong. You're not wrong, but I want to give you a loving and kind brotherly warning. The average American Christian shares their faith once every 27 years. That is a real statistic. To me, that is evidence that the average American Christian has no idea how much love there is projected at them by the triune God. Therefore, they have no idea what loving him with their whole heart and soul and mind means. So the Great Commission or living Great Commissionally is absolutely rendered irrelevant in their lives. And what a dangerous thing. This church is the most missional church I've ever been a part of. There are 4,000 of us, more or less, that would call Good Shepherd home. And rounding way up, there are 80 families or so that are living the Great Commission overseas. Statistically, that means 2%, or to say it other, the other way, 98% of us are staying home when the Great Commission has that into all the nations, go into the whole nation, or on all the nations and make disciples of all men. I don't believe that 98% is the right number for this church body. I believe there's many of you with a calling on your life to do what, what we're doing and take the gospel into all the nations, it's not easy. I love the example and attitude of my friend Justin Latham. I've been getting to know him, fellow surfer. He was telling me the other day, man, I want to go. If the Lord opened up the way to go, man, we would do it. We have a heart for the nations. We love discipling. We love this. We want to go. But God right now is holding us here, creating systems and, and structures to support and send more people. Meanwhile, we're discipling. There's life flourishing around us, and we feel God has called us to be here for this season. So my question to you guys is, like Justin, can you confirm your calling to be here? If you can, praise God, well done, I applaud you. But man, if you can't confirm that your calling is to stay in this, in this congregation, in this community, to go in and to not go into all of the nations, if you cannot confirm that calling, I want to call you out and say, what good is it to gain the whole world but forfeit your soul. If your savior, if your leader, if, if the triune God is calling you to fulfill the great commission in that way, don't miss it. Step into it and watch the blessings overflow in your life. But again, it all has to flow out of loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind because he first loved you. The great commission will not be sustained without the great command. Now let me pray for you. Father, Son, Spirit, fill us, move in us now to respond to that four-dimensional love that you've shown us time and time and time again. Open our hearts to realize the redemptive purposes you have for us, the forgiveness offered, the pursuit of our lives personally that you've continued to bring. We love you. We trust you. Move us exactly where you would want us to be. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.